All right. Well, thank you very much for coming to this talk. I am super, super excited uh, to be here today to present uh, uh, LogoFail and the security implication of image parsing during system boot. Just a quick introduction. I am Fabio Pagani. I work at Bannerly in the research uh, team. At Bannerly, I mainly focus on vulnerability and threat research and on program analysis, with a focus on fuzzing and uh, dynamic analysis. Of course, uh, LogoFail was not a single man effort, but it was a rather a collective push from uh, the entire Bannerly research team. So uh, I just want to say a big thanks to Alex Matrozov, Yegor Vasilenko, Alex Yarmolov, Sam Toma, and Antov Ivanov for their great contribution to this project. But uh, OK, I guess you're all here to hear about LogoFail. And um, LogoFail is an example of a vulnerability related to the processing of untrusted data from UFI firmware components. Uh, we actually worked uh, quite a lot uh, on, uh, on this uh, at Binary. And uh, for instance, uh, last year, we discovered a new class of attacks that uh, we call data-only attacks uh, against the UFI firmware. And uh, the root cause of these attacks uh, is um, uh, because there is insecure handling of content that comes uh, from uh, read-write areas uh, uh, of the firmware, which can be tampered by an attacker, so from the NVRAM in particular. And these attacks are impactful because they allow to bypass uh, secure boot and also uh, all the different shades of hardware verified, uh, hardware based verified boot, such as the boot guard. Also, when these, uh, when these uh, problems and these attacks uh, happen at the beginning of the UFI boot process, like in the pre UFI stage, they can also lead to, to a compromise of uh, Intel, uh, uh, to, sorry, to other, to a compromise of security protection, such as uh, Intel PPAM. And so, you know, in our quest to secure the UFI firmware supply chain, we actually started exploring new attack surfaces. And uh, we went back to our platform, and we actually observed that the number of image parsers in firmware are increasing, and image parsers are actually common. And now I'm sure that many of you are asking yourself, but why do we even need to have image parsers during boot? Well, for sure there is a lot of uh, graphical elements, for instance, in the setup interface that needs to be uh, parsed uh, and rendered. But then there is also another element that is always, always shown during boot. And uh, this is the boot logo, right? As soon as you, st as soon as you start up your machine, uh, one of the first things that you see on the screen is actually the, a logo from the uh, device vendor. And at this point, we recalled that uh, the boot logo can be uh, customized. And this is mainly done for branding purposes, or you know, maybe if you're a gamer and you want uh, just to put uh, a super cool uh, logo, uh, then uh, you know, th the vendors let you do so. And at this point, it's uh, when we connected the dots. So what if these image parsing libraries are used to parse uh, and display the boot logo? And what if this boot logo can actually be customized uh, from the operating system. And so we went on the internet and uh, tried to find past uh, research in this area. And uh, the only bug that we found uh, related to this uh, was presented at uh, Black Hat USA 2009, where uh, Rafal and Alex uh, found the bug in the BMP parser of uh, Tiano Core uh, reference code. And they actually explored this bug. Uh, unfortunately, history repeats itself, and uh, computer security is not an exception. And uh, so here we are, 15 years later, where we have modern UFI firmware not supporting a single image format, but supporting multiple of them, from common uh, formats such as uh, PNG to esoteric stuff uh, such as PCX and TGA. And the second bad news is that the uh, user can actually pass image data to these, uh, to these parsers. 
and uh, through, the, through all the various log customization that uh, the vendors uh, allow. Uh, and the third bad news is that uh, the image parsing is done during boot, in particular, particularly during the Dixie phase. Uh, it's done by code that is written in C, so it's very prone to memory corruption uh, errors and problems. And the cherry on top is that uh, in the UEFI world, there are little to no mitigation for the exploitation of software vulnerability. So what could go wrong? Well, I guess you might at this point imagine how the stuff went, but uh, meet the LogoFail. LogoFail is a new set of uh, security vulnerabilities that affect uh, parsing libraries, libraries used during the device boot process. As you can see in this diagram, um, the supply chain ecosystem of UFI is super complex. We have the silicon vendor that uh, produce uh, a reference implementation, which uh, is called EDK2, and then this reference implementation is um, uh, improved by uh, IBVs, such as inside AMI and Phoenix, and this improved version then is sent to uh, OEMs and device vendors. And since LogoFail affects the, um, the reference implementation from the IBVs, then we have uh, a, basically an impact on the entire ecosystem of UFI. Uh, LogoFail, as I said, is UFI and IBV specific, and this also means that uh, it's a cross uh, silicon attack. And we found uh, actually devices um, vulnerable to LogoFail, both uh, in x86 uh, and ARM. Also, uh, the uh, 150 days uh, embargo uh, lifts today. Uh, we spend a considerable amount of time working with vendors to make sure that you know, they understand the problem and they release patches. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, you guys are one of the first uh, people in the world to uh, hear about all the details, all the story behind uh, LogoFail. But what are the implications of, of LogoFail? Uh, in particular, with, uh, the, the, in, in particular uh, on the recent discoveries uh, that were done in the UFI world. Um, attacks such as uh, button drop, they mostly focus on uh, bypassing secure boot and by and impacting uh, the bootloaders. And these attacks can be generally detected uh, with uh, signature-based uh, uh, scanning. On the other hand, LogoFail goes a step further because uh, as we can see with LogoFail, uh, we are able to uh, get down to the firmware level, to the Dixie phase, and this allows us to bypass secure boot, but also to bypass uh, other security features. Okay, so I think that was enough for introduction. Uh, let's get a, a little bit more technical. Uh, let's see uh, what we found. The first uh, um, step in this exploration was to find the image parsers. And it actually turned out that uh, finding them is not that difficult. In particular, for Inside and Phoenix, we can just uh, search uh, for uh, the, the color name, and we will immediately find the Dixie modules which implement the image parser. For AMI, this is a little bit more difficult, and it requires a little bit more uh, reversing, because AMI uh, basically put uh, all of its code uh, in, uh, in a single module called uh, AMI-TC, so we need to do a little bit more of, of reversing, but uh, nothing uh, too difficult. And at this point, we find where the image parsing uh, libraries and functions are located, and so now we want to understand uh, where the data that they actually can parse uh, comes from. And uh, also, uh, for, uh, for implementing this analysis, we just uh, did a lot of uh, uh, reversing, actually, with uh, FI Explorer, which is a plugin for IDA that we developed uh, at Binary. And uh, we basically start uh, from the image parsing functions and then just uh, look backwards uh, to understand where the data is actually coming from. Um, Nothing too fancy, honestly. Uh, but uh, w when you do this process, it, uh, you will find that um, in many cases, the data source um, where the image is, is read from is a firmware volume. And in general, firmware volumes are uh, signed by BootGuard, so they cannot be 
compromised uh, by an attacker. However, in many other cases, you will also find different uh, OEM-specific customizations. Um, one of the most common ones uh, is, uh, for instance, that the firmware reads the logo from a specified location on the ESP. So you can just drop a logo there, reboot, and then the firmware will uh, pick the, the logo from the, from the ESP. In other cases, instead, the logo is stored into an unsigned volume of a firmware update. So we can just uh, store our image there, flash the update, and this will be enough to install our logo. Finally, sometimes uh, NVRAM variables are involved uh, into this process. And in certain cases, uh, we have uh, an NVRAM variable which contains the path to the logo. And in other cases, instead, the NVRAM variable actually contains the, uh, the logo itself. So um, allowing users, in general, to customize their logo is uh, an acceptable behavior, right? Uh, only though if uh, the image parsing libraries uh, don't contain uh, uh, any security bug. And so we decided to use some fuzzing to actually check how secure these, um, these parser are. Um, turns out that um, fuzzing uh, image parsers, in particular UEFI image parsers, is uh, not that complicated, actually. First of all, uh, Dixie modules, where the parsers are implemented, are uh, RP files. So it's very easy to um, parse them and to load them in memory. And also, the uh, UEFI environment uh, uh, that they need to run, uh, it's uh, very minimal. And uh, we just need to um, set certain UEFI tables which are used by the modules. And after we set these pointers in the, the, in the data section of the module, then uh, the, the parser will just run um, happily. And as a fuzzer, we actually uh, developed some uh, new emulation-based capabilities that we were able to, um, to integrate with uh, libafl. The uh, last uh, component that we need uh, for fuzzing is a fuzzing harness. And we actually needed to write a harness for each of the parser that we, uh, that we identified. And the, the harness is uh, very important because it works as a bridge between uh, the fuzzer and the fuzzed module. Uh, our harnesses, uh, what they do uh, is that they mainly bring the module in an initialized state, and then they prepare the call to uh, a parsing function. And finally, they basically get uh, fuzzer generated data, they inject it inside the, inside the target module, and then they just run the they just run the parsing function, and then they check for crashes. So at this point, uh, we have all the ingredients that we need uh, for fuzzing. And uh, what happens when you fuzz parsers, which are written in C, and that were never fuzzed before? Well, you get hundreds of crashes. You get crashes, crashes everywhere. So many crashes that uh, we decided it was actually a good investment to um, extend uh, our internal uh, program analysis framework to help us triaging them. Because otherwise, it was going to be a nightmare, and uh, humans, you know, in general, don't scale as well as, uh, as machines. Um, this is actually an excerpt of all the different uh, root causes that we identified. And uh, we, in total, found 21 unit, uh, unique root causes and 50 of which we deem to be very likely exploitable. As you can see from the CWE column, uh, we actually found uh, several different bug, cl bug classes from uh, less serious null pointer references and out of bound reads to higher impact uh, global buffer overflows and heap overflows. Uh, I just want to add, though, a little uh, peculiarity, uh, a little note, uh, since we're working with firmware. And um, even less serious um, vulnerabilities, such as out-of-bound reads, can actually lead to a denial-of-service attack. But a denial-of-service attack uh, during boot uh, means that the device will not boot. And so the device actually is bricked, right? 
uh, the, the operating system will never even get a chance to start. So they are, uh, these bug classes are for sure uh, less uh, serious, uh, but they can still have a big impact, uh, for instance, on organizations. And you will actually find all the details about all the other bugs uh, in a blog post that we will uh, release uh, today. I just want to go now uh, and uh, show you a couple of these um, uh, bugs that we found. The first one is in the BMP parser developed by Inside. And uh, um, as you can see in the first box, we are accessing an array BLT buffer depending on uh, using as an index uh, uh, multiple variables. And uh, when pixel 8 and i are 0, then we will access uh, BLT buffer at index uh, pixel width times minus 1, which is minus pixel width, right? And uh, since pixel width uh, is taken directly from the BMP header, this means that we can access basically any memory below BLT buffer. And this turns into a security problem in the second box because the BLT variable, which is initialized with this address, is actually used as a target uh, for a write. And uh, in, for this write, we also control the content that, that we are writing. Uh, so by using this bug, we can basically do an arbitrary write anywhere um, be just below the uh, BLT buffer. This other bug was instead found find in the JPEG parser developed by AMI. And uh, here, uh, the problem is that uh, the developers assume that a JPEG cannot contain more than four Youthman tables. And so they simply statically locate um, this array called the Youthman tables with four um, entries. Uh, the problem is, though, uh, is that uh, as an attacker, we can put uh, you know, more than four Youthman tables. And the index used to access uh, the Youthman tables array is not checked. So it can be more than four. And um, this means that we can basically overflow on global data with pointers to our image, which you know, can become uh, a, a problem. So uh, just a couple of takeaways from uh, this uh, Fudzing experiment. Um, I am very confident in saying that um, none of these libraries were ever, ever Fudz by IBVs or OEMs. And I can say so because uh, we found crashes in every parser that uh, we tested. The first crashes actually were found uh, just after a few seconds of fuzzing. And also, actually, some parser even crash with images downloaded from the internet. So with images that uh, should, be, should be valid. And I just also, also want to take a second to thank the Internet Archive, uh, because uh, do you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said that uh, we uh, found a PCX, a, a, P, a parser for PCX, which is something that, honestly, I never heard before. And actually, it turned out that uh, you know, finding a good corpus for the Fadzer is not easy, uh, until we found this uh, ISO from uh, stored on the Internet Archive uh, with uh, 1,700 images of bears and planes and whatever, that actually turned out to be a very good corpus for our Fadzer and helped us explore the uh, parser. All right, so um, at this point, you know, we could have just stopped here and called it a day, and that's actually what we did uh, because we got in touch uh, with uh, OEMs. Uh, but then we also decided to go a step further. Um, we actually want to develop a proof of concept uh, to really show the impact of uh, our findings. So we went and we bought a real device a Lenovo Think Center M70. We updated the, B the BIOS uh, to a version, uh, to the latest version of the time. We extracted the image parser from the BIOS, we fudged them, and then uh, we uh, basically uh, started selecting a crash uh, uh, that we can turn into a, into a, a proof of concept. And uh, we found one of these crashes uh, that um, was uh, both targeting a simple format and also, it was very likely to be exploitable in the PNG parser uh, developed by AMI that is present on this device. Uh, before I show you the bug, though, uh, I just want to remind I, how PNG uh, works, in particular for this parser. And uh, 
What it does, uh, this parser, is to, first of all, find the high header chunk that contains a bunch of information about the image, uh, such as the width and the height. And then uh, it basically takes all the idle chunks and uh, stores them into, uh, uh, into a buffer. And uh, this buffer is then uh, uh, decompressed into a third buffer called, uh, that we call output buffer. And this is actually the final data that will be displayed on the, on the screen. And uh, the bucket that we selected as a starting point is an integer overflow on the 32-bit uh, value used as allocation size. As you can see on the screenshot, we are calling uh, the allocate uh, zero pool function, uh, and we pass uh, a value that depends on PNG width. And this PNG width is what is read from the PNG header. And uh, the problem is that uh, this multiplication can actually overflow when PNG width uh, becomes, uh, you know, large enough. And uh, what it turns out is that um, we will basically allocate an output buffer which is not big enough to contain the uncompressed data. And uh, by using this bug, it's actually very straightforward to get uh, a heap overflow with uh, arbitrary content and arbitrary length. But wait a minute. So how does heap exploitation even work for UFI? Uh, you know, if you were pointing the Linux kernel or some other, um, <clears throat> some other target, we would maybe just go on the internet and find some recent white traps and maybe try to cannibalize some techniques uh, from there. But uh, for UFI, there is not uh, anything out there. The second big problem is that um, we don't have uh, any debugging capabilities on the device because uh, Intel DCI doesn't work on uh, new CPU models, and also Intel Boot Card uh, prevents uh, replacing modules. So we cannot, uh, for instance, uh, try to inject uh, some debugging stubs uh, into any of the modules because Boot Guard will prevent us uh, to do so. And uh, the other big problem is that we actually don't get uh, any sort of output. Even on crash, we just uh, see a blank screen. But uh, okay, let's uh, maybe solve uh, one problem at a time. So how the UFI heap works is actually pretty simple. The UFI heap is uh, pool-based, meaning that the heap manager um, keeps a different free list, which are sorted by size. And uh, when it receives a memory allocation request uh, via the allocate pool function, which is basically malloc, uh, it just uh, finds the correct free list, and links the first element, and then return this element to, to the caller. Once uh, we call uh, free on a chunk, uh, the heap manager will take some metadata from the pool head and pool tail uh, objects. And these metadata are, uh, are basically all the information that the heap manager needs to put this chunk back into the uh, correct uh, free list. And, uh, you know, from these, uh, um, from these internals of the UFI heap, and this is also what happens in many other heap allocation, uh, heap allocators, sorry, um, this means that um, allocated and free chunks actually co coexist in memory. They are in the same pages, they are one after the other. And uh, since we are exploiting an heap overflow, this means that we can then overflow either in an allocated chunk or uh, in a free chunk. But there is a little problem, guys, is that we don't have any debugging capabilities. So we cannot just put a breakpoint uh, where the overflow happens and check what's after our chunk. Uh, so we don't even know what we are overflowing into. Now some good news, finally. Uh, the first good news <laughs> is that uh, um, UFI memory is actually not cleared after the operating system start. So if the operating system doesn't overwrite it, uh, we can just uh, dump the memory used by UFI. It's somewhere there in, in memory. And the second good news is that um, uh, the developers of this uh, library forgot to call free on the output buffer. So this means that by simply using a pattern, we can search uh, where, where out, our uh, output buffer is. And now I know that everybody's looking at uh, what's uh, allocated after the output buffer, because this is what uh, you know, 
it looks like uh, we can overflow into. The problem is that uh, this is actually not the object that we can corrupt, because uh, this view of the memory uh, is a view that we get uh, way after the overflow can happen. And so this means that uh, the heap uh, layout and the heap um, chunks, the heap state, actually change. So what we are looking at is actually the last object that, that was left there, not the object that is there uh, at the overflow time. So we basically need to find a way to, with our overflow, to fix the object uh, which is there so we can uh, basically inspect it and see if we can corrupt it. And we actually found this technique um, to preserve heap chunks, which is, um, we actually found it by reading the free, the source code of, of the free function. And as you can see in the box, one of the first uh, thing that the free function does is to check if the signature of the chunk that we are uh, freeing matches a certain value. Uh, and if it doesn't, free simply returns uh, with an invalid uh, parameter error. So it, if the signature doesn't match, the chunk that we are freed, freeing is not put back into the free list and is not reused. So this means that uh, with our overflow, we can simply corrupt the signature of the next chunk and that chunk will stay there because it will, it will not be reused for any other, uh, any further memory allocation. And the technique works. As you can see here, we just wrote an X where the signature of the allocated chunk is. And what we're looking at finally is the object which is there at the overflow time. Okay, let's do a little recap. What we achieved so far is that we have arbitrary overflow on the heap, we can prevent the next chunk from being freed, and we can also inspect uh, the object which is uh, stored into the next chunk. So what's left? Uh, we need to find, first of all, a good candidate for corruption, and we also uh, need to get uh, code execution out of it. Um, now, in general, uh, um, heap overflows uh, usually uh, require um, strong allocation and allocation primitives. What I mean? Uh, I mean that the attacker usually does uh, hundreds of allocations and the allocation in arbitrary order to basically bring the heap in a state that is favorable to the attacker. Um, we don't have such a good uh, primitives in our case, but uh, uh, we can actually influence the state of the heap by adding and removing uh, certain uh, PNG chunks and changing their sizes. So basically, uh, by you know, doing these modifications uh, to the PNG, we can actually influence the state of the heap, and so this means that uh, our output buffer will be allocated in different uh, portion of the memory. And uh, after a while of trying with this combination of PNG chunks, uh, we found uh, that uh, our output buffer was allocated just before a protocol entry. And at this point, uh, you know, we finally felt that adrenaline rush, we knew that we were going to bring this home uh, because uh, protocols and protocol entry are a super core concept in UFI. And uh, protocol entry has actually multiple pointers to objects uh, that reference uh, um, interfaces and function pointers. So this means that by overflowing inside the protocol entry, we can change uh, where this pointer uh, points, and so we can maybe you know uh, force uh, the UFI system to call one of the one of our uh, interfaces. And uh, we actually, sorry, we actually had the multiple venue of corruption, uh, either uh, corrupting uh, objects related to uh, protocols uh, interface or object uh, related to the notification system. And in the end, we decided to target uh, the second one. And uh, long story short, uh, what happens is that um, the UFI has uh, um, uh, this event system, and events are generated when protocols are installed. So with our overflow, we can uh, simply recreate all the structures that are needed uh, by the UFI event system, such that when the protocol that we specify in the protocol entry is installed, our callback handler function will be executed. 
No worries, we will actually publish uh, the blog post with all the details about the exploitation. I know it, maybe it's a little bit difficult to, to see uh, for the first time. Um, but uh, ba basically using this technique, when this protocol that we specify in protocol entry will be installed, we will get uh, you know, our callback handler function um, called. And the last bit that we need to sort is uh, where we want to jump. And turns out that finally, this is very easy uh, in UFI because uh, the memory region where NVRAM variables uh, are stored is more often than not executable. And, uh, and it's always mapped at the same address. So this means that we can simply store our shellcode there, and it's always going to be always there, and it's going to be in a region which is um, uh, executable. Um, at this stage, uh, you have uh, full control over the platform, and uh, that's actually what we want to show with our shellcode. We didn't just settle for a simple shellcode that can uh, print a, an hello world or uh, you know, a pwn message or some, 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 some stuff like that. We actually did uh, some more advanced shellcode uh, because uh, what it does is that uh, it, uh, first of all, disables secure boot. So it can start a second stage payload that we store on the disk. And uh, this second stage payload uh, is able to uh, replace the NTFS, dri NTFS driver that is uh, loaded with a driver that uh, supports uh, writes to the file system. So that uh, the second stage payload is then also able to create a file on the Windows file system. And you know, this is just to showcase a little bit uh, uh, some advanced uh, behaviors of threats at this, uh, at this level. Okay, let's put it all together. Then I just have a, a, a short uh, demo video to show, and then we are done. Uh, how a log of failure attacks works and how we uh, develop our proof of concept. First of all, we store a malicious PNG on the ESP or in the NVRAM, depending on different uh, customization methods uh, which are used in the firmware. Uh, then we create uh, all the notification objects, such as protocol notify, the I event, and the shellcode, and we store them in NVRAM. We save a second, second stage payload on disk and we reboot the system. Now uh, the system will uh, start to boot, and uh, as soon as it uh, will pick up uh, our um, PNG image, we'll parse it, and the heap overflow will happen. The heap overflow will corrupt the protocol entry, and will set all the pointers to the protocol notify and to the I event uh, structure that we stored in NVRAM. When the protocol that we specified during the corruption, during the overflow, will be installed, we will achieve uh, uh, arbitrary code execution. And um, this arbitrary code execution, we will be seen uh, with a shell code running that is also able to um, run a second stage payload. All right, so we actually have a cool demo. Uh, let's see if it works, hopefully it does. Cool, so this is the demo that we uh, recorded on the device that I showed you at the beginning of, of this section. And as you can see here, we are just logging in inside the Windows 11 machine. Then uh, we start um, a, a terminal with the admin privileges. We now check that uh, modern security features, such as uh, Secure Boot and Boot Guard, are actually enabled. So you know we didn't cut any corner uh, to make uh, this demo. And we finally execute uh, our POC. This is all that creates all the NVRAM stuff, it saves the PNG, and now we reboot the system. Now, as soon as the system will uh, reboot, you will see a message printed on the screen. And this is us printing from firmware, uh, which is pretty cool, I think. And now, as you can see, we log in into Windows, and our second stage payload was able uh, to inject uh, a file on the Windows file system. So. It, it worked out in the end. Thank you, guys. This was very, very painful to, uh, to develop because of the not debugging capabilities and the basically blank screen or working uh, behavior that the device has. So I really appreciate this uh, round of applause. Uh, OK, let me just recap, and uh, we are done. Uh, the majority of UFI firmware out there contains uh, vulnerable image parsers. Uh, and we found that hundreds of devices 
from Lenovo, Intel, and Acer actually allow uh, logo customization. And so they are very likely explo exploitable uh, for like an attack uh, that, that we just show in the video. Logo fail doesn't require any sort of physical access. It can be done entirely from the operating system. And uh, it targets, uh, is cross silicon because it targets both x86 and ARM devices. And also modern defenses uh, such as Secure Boot or Boot Guard are completely ineffective uh, against it. I just also want to take a second to uh, say a big thanks to SearchCC for helping us uh, coordinating uh, this uh, massive industry-wide disclosure. And I also want to take a second, uh, this is more a little bit on, on a sad uh, side of things, uh, is that uh, unfortunately not all vendors uh, follow strict embargo dates. And uh, some of them, uh, um, they publish details uh, a week before they are supposed to. And that's not, all, that's not uh, it, because they also don't credit uh, the vendors. And this is you know, not a behavior that I think in 2023 should be acceptable anymore in the security community. I thought you know, we left this stuff uh, in, in the past. All right, guys, so that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, please just uh, go to the microphone. If you see me around the conference, please just come and talk with me. I'm always super happy to talk about firmware security. And of course, don't forget to update your firmware. Thank you very much. Maybe a short question. So have you considered to try to read out the memory using PCI Express? Uh, no, that's, uh, that's something that we didn't consider. Yeah, okay. But yeah, I think, I think you, you can do some, uh, something with that, but that would require some um, physical access to the device, right? Sure. Thank you. So I have a question on um, two things. First thing is, so to, in order to use this vulnerability, you need to be, you need to have administrator privileges. Because yes. to write in the ESP, you need to be root on Linux or admin on Windows. Yep. To write a UEFI variable, you need to also be uh, some sort of administrator. So in the context of secure boot, uh, you need to compromise completely the machine first, which is already booted, in order to further compromise the firmware, right? Yeah. So, uh, my first question is, what do we expect to gain from, um, if we already have all those privileges, the best we can do is persistence, right? Or uh, is, there more to the, is there more to that? No, I, see, I, I definitely see your point. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we are uh, going uh, over a boundary which we should not be able to, um, to, you know, to overcome, uh, because uh, you, know, you shouldn't be able to execute a Dixie code from the operating system. And, you know, even if you have the highest privileges on the OS. So this is what we want to show to showcase here. Okay. And uh, also, um, depending at what stage of Dixie the, 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 um, the parsing happens, you might be able to actually have some uh, stronger primitive than just bypassing secure boot. So you can implant a really um, some, um, some boot kit or some stuff like that at that, that, that level. That, that was my follow up question quickly. Um, you talk about secure boot. What about mature boot in this context? Uh, I'm not super familiar with that, if I okay. have to be honest. Uh, just if you can just shoot us an email, uh, I think that would be you know, the, the, the best way. <laughs> sure, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, thank you for a uh, fantastic talk. Um, my first question was just to ask from the uh, guy before me, so I go with my second one. Um, if there is a system uh, so that the um, hardware is encrypted via BitLocker or something else, um, this logo file, is it able to write uh, in the encrypted area or just can decrypt it? Honestly, I'm not super familiar with BitLocker as well, so I, I don't know. I think that's the best answer that, that, I, that I can give you. Um, I will, I will, I will check, and uh, you know maybe we'll do some exploration in that in that area as well. But again, if you shoot us an email, you know we will uh, we will figure it out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hello, thank you for talk. For your talk, uh, could you explain how you uh, injected your logo from operation system? Because for the good vendor, uh, right access to the SPI flash in any. In, 
place is forbidden. Yeah, yeah. Yes, some vendors like Gigabyte allows you to rewrite Flash at all, but you know. I, I definitely see your point. Uh, we actually found that uh, you know the OEMs actually have different customizations that allow they have different methods that allow a logo to be customized, and in certain cases, uh, you know the logo is just read from the ESP. So you don't need to flash anything. The spy flash, uh, it's already well locked, uh, as, as, you, as you said. So you don't need to compromise anything there. You just need to store uh, your logo in the... I, I hope I got your question. Uh, I, I understand. I, I mean that from operation system, you don't have access, uh, direct access to a spy controller because it's available only from SMM. Yeah. For example, you are updating your firmware through SMM, and SMM in general checks check uh, signature or something like this. And how you bypass this? Uh, we don't need to bypass it because these mechanisms are already embedded into the firmware of your device. So your firmware, without changing anything, will already go and check if there is any image in uh, uh, on the ESP or inside an NVM variable or other stuff. If you refer to the second case, um, the, the section where the logo is stored is actually unsigned. So we can just store a logo there in the capsule update, and then we can just use that to flash, and uh, nobody will complain, uh, BIOSGuard or, uh, or any other SM SMM, uh, SMM stuff, because uh, that, that part is not signed. So we don't need to compromise uh, the spy flash or to put any additional code there. It's, uh, everything is, is already there. All the logic is already there. Uh, we just need to basically save the, the logo where the firmware expects it. I see. It means that you got uh, the origin capsule from, I don't know, from internet and just uh, remove original image and push, uh, put your image inside and just uh, trigger uh, firmware update procedure. Yes, but that, 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 that doesn't work for every OEMs. That works only for the OEMs that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. leave. Yeah, because sometimes the whole capsule has a signature. Yeah. All. yeah, exactly, 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 yes. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Uh, we see. are done? Okay, yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, let's just have a quick chat uh, later. So, sorry, do I talk now or chat after then? Just, uh, One. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, you said that um, if you just do the sort of blind fuzzing of it without trying to construct an exploit, it bricks the device. To what extent does it break the device? Is it something where I can fix something on the hard disk, or is it a full hardware mess up? Because I could see, you know, a, a reasonably low skill attacker, you know, filling an entire enterprise's PC with yes, that yeah. and just killing everything at a yes, hardware. Yes, that's 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 something that unfortunately can happen. Uh, because, uh, I mean, the device is bricked in the sense uh, not that it's uh, broken, but, uh, you know, all the hardware works uh, well. The problem is that uh, um, once the firmware uh, starts uh, to... Basically, the firmware will just throw an exception, a page fault or whatever, and so the CPU will stop there at the parsing, uh, the parsing routines. It will not progress to the operating system. And um, depending on the customization mechanism that are implemented in the firmware, uh, in certain cases, you may need to uh, remove the hard drive and remove the logo from the ESP. So when you put the hard drive back and you just boot, the firmware will not find the logo there and, and it will not just, uh, it will just boot. But in other cases, instead, uh, like in the um, unsigned uh, firmware capsule update, for those cases, you need to go there and to really um, attach the spy flash chip and to erase the place where this is. Yeah, because you don't have a, a controller, right, uh, of, on, on the device. Uh, it's, um, yeah, right. can be a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, perfect. No, I, th I, th I, think, I think we're done. Let's just have a chat. All right. Thank you very much again.